In two weeks, it'll be the 4th of July. Now, I don't know what your normal Independence Day celebration would be, but let's use our sanctified imagination this morning. Suppose a relative of yours invites you and your whole family and all of your relatives over to his house for a wonderful 4th of July celebration. Well, of course, you accept the invitation and you go over to his house and all of your relatives are there. And you arrive just in time for a delicious 4th of July picnic lunch. Your host escorts you into the kitchen where you see on the kitchen table an array of your favorite foods for the 4th of July. And then the host announces that this year it'll be self-serve, that you'll be able to parade all around the kitchen table and choose whatever foods you want for that holiday feast. He then says that after everyone gets what they want to eat, you'll go out to the back porch where there's a number of picnic tables set up. Everyone will find a seat and you'll enjoy the delicious food. And so you look down at the kitchen table and you see all of your favorite 4th of July foods. There's hot dogs and hamburgers. There's grilled chicken. There's corn on the cob baked beans, coleslaw, an array of different types of salad, potato salad, macaroni salad, pasta salad, a number of different types of chips, and then of course a mouth-watering melon for dessert. Well, your host after prayer looks at you and says, you're gonna be the first through the line. And then he offers you a choice of one of two plates. He says that you can either choose to have a clean plate to put all that delicious food on, a clean plate right out of the dishwasher, or you can have the dirty dog bowl that's been sitting on the floor that the dog has been eating out of. And you get to choose what you want to put all your holiday food on in order to eat. Now, which are you going to choose? Well, you say to me, Doug, it's a no-brainer. Of course I'm going to choose. Anybody in their right mind would be choosing the clean plate. Now, listen to what the Apostle Paul tells you. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. What Paul is telling you here is that God wants to use you. You say, well, I'm not perfect but God is not asking you to be perfect. But what God does want you to be is clean. He wants to use you as a clean instrument for his purposes. So how do you go from being an ignoble article to a noble article? From being clay and wood to being silver and gold? from being a dog bowl to a clean plate. Well, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter two. Please turn there with me in your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter two. We've been working our way through the book of 2 Timothy. We've been going through passage by passage and we know that the book of 2 Timothy, it's Paul's last words to Timothy. And consequently, Paul's very last words to you and to me. In 2 Timothy, Paul is talking about essentials. Essentials of the Christian life and ministry. And at the very end of chapter 2, Paul tells you what you need to do to be used by God. And it all has to do with your walk and your talk. That is, it has to do with what you do 
and what you say. So first of all, notice that if you want to be used of God, you need to have a right walk. Look at what Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, we've seen this word flee before. You say we have? Yes, we have. Back in our study of the book of 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul uses the word flee. And we mentioned back there that the word flee is the Greek word fugo, from which we get our English word fugitive. And you know what a fugitive is. It's a person who's on the run. It's a person who is escaping and evading someone or something that's after him. Well, Paul tells you to be a fugitive when it comes to youthful lusts. When we hear the term youthful lusts or youthful desires, we normally think in terms of sexual immorality. And that can be true, but we don't want to limit it to that. There are other youthful lusts, lusts of the youth, de desires of the youth that we see. And particularly today, I see one of them being materialism, the, the love of money that Paul addresses, by the way, back in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Back there, Paul warns, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with working hard and earning money. That's not what Paul is saying here. But what Paul is talking about is warning against the evil desire and lust for money. And you know, there, there are people who are just infatuated with money. That's all they think about. Morning, noon, and night, they're just possessed with getting more and more and more. They have a craving, a deep love for money. CNN carried a story about a 62-year-old man who was rushed to the Cholet General Hospital in France. He was suffering from severe stomach pain. And his family told the doctors that this man had a habit of swallowing coins. So the doctors were prepared to look at the x-rays and to see perhaps some coins in the man's stomach. But what even the doctors saw shocked them. Because when they reviewed the man's x-rays, they found 350 coins in the man's stomach. And so they performed surgery to get those coins out. But the man died 12 days later of complications. Now, I don't know any people who swallow coins. And probably you don't either. And hopefully you're not one of those people who swallow coins. But you know, there are many people who are gorging themselves sick with the love of money and materialism. And Paul warns us that the love of money is a primary root of all kinds of evil. It causes people to wander from the faith because of their greed. And that's why Paul tells us to keep away from it, to be a fugitive, to run as fast and as far away from the love of money and youthful lusts as you can. But while you're running away from something, you also need to be running to something, towards something. And the Apostle Paul tells us what we should be running to in verse 22. He says, for example, to follow after righteousness. The word righteousness here means right living. 
It means living according to God's standards, not the standards of the world. I'm reminded of what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9. Paul says, I make it my aim to please the Lord. That was Paul's goal. That's what he was pursuing. He wanted to live a life pleasing to the Lord. He was pursuing or following after righteousness. And that's what we need to do. We need to live a life pleasing to the Lord. We need to live according to his standards. Next, Paul says to follow after faith. Now, faith is confident trust. And we need to put our trust in the Lord. So trust in God to keep his promises. Trust in God to meet your needs. Trust in God to provide the resources you need to accomplish his will. Next, Paul says to follow after love. And here's the Greek term agape. And you've heard of agape love before. It's sacrificial love. It's selfless love. Someone has once defined agape love as the unselfish, sacrificial giving of yourself for the benefit of others without expecting to be repaid. And Paul describes this kind of love for us in what many refer to as the love chapter of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. There, Paul describes love in these terms. He says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And that's the type of love that Paul calls upon you to pursue in life. You are to follow after love. And then finally, Paul says to follow after peace. Have you ever had a fight with someone? We all have. And usually when there's a conflict, people respond in one of two ways. Usually they respond by either fight or flight. They either dig in their heels and are ready for a fight with someone to be aggressive towards that individual. Or they respond by practicing avoidance. They just leave the situation and, and don't even try to reconcile with the person or, or deal with the conflict. And yet Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So are you a peacemaker? Do you try to work things out with others when there's conflict for a mutual beneficial relationship between you? See, that's what Paul means by pursuing peace. Not, not fighting with the person and not avoiding the person, but rather making sure you pursue peace, making sure that you pursue mutual benefit in times of conflict. So Paul says here, you're to follow after righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And then the Apostle Paul adds this statement. Along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. See, God never meant for you to walk the road of the Christian life alone. As a matter of fact, the New Testament knows nothing of Lone Ranger Christianity. You were made to have your brothers and sisters in Christ in fellowship with you. You know, we're coming into a post-COVID era. People are gathering together again. They're, they're no longer in isolation. People have gotten their COVID shots. Uh, they're, they're not staying away. They're gathering together in groups. Different places are opening up in our community. 
And of course, we have in-service, uh, in-person services here at Shiloh. And you know, it's great to see people in worship with us, brothers and sisters in Christ in corporate worship. And so I want to encourage you, if you're home right now, uh, maybe in your pajamas, drinking a cup of coffee, sitting on the sofa, watching this service, let me encourage you to start coming to in-person services here at Shiloh once again. You need the fellowship and the camaraderie of your brothers and sisters in Christ. It was fine for you to view these services online during COVID, but things are opening up again. Consider returning to Shiloh or to your place of worship, your local church, to enjoy the fellowship of others. You need that encouragement. You need what brothers and sisters in Christ are able to give you. They will encourage you to continue on the path of pursuing righteousness and faith and love and peace. So to be useful to God, you need a right walk. You must run from evil and run toward righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with your brothers and sisters in Christ. But you know, that's not all. In addition to a right walk, you also need a right talk. Look at what Paul says. Look at your Bibles with me in verses 23 through 26. Paul says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Now, in context here, I believe that Paul is talking about false teachers. And he's telling us not to argue with them, not, not to fight with them, not to quarrel with them. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you can't talk to them. That doesn't mean that you can't discuss the scriptures with them, because the passage here talks about instructing them so you, so you can uh, dialogue with them. There's nothing wrong with that. And hopefully they will hear the truth. They will repent of their false teaching. They will embrace the truth and they will escape the clutches of Satan. That's our hope. That is our prayer. And you know, this does happen. I'm teaching an online course for Moody Bible Institute. It's an eight-week course right now, and it's on systematic theology. And one of the students in the course during our discussion board question uh, let us know that he used to be a Jehovah's Witness. He was deeply involved in that cult. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses, he said, is a works-related religion. They believe that you have to work in order to merit Jehovah's favor in order to enter into his kingdom. And so this student talked about the field service that he needed to do while a Jehovah's Witness. He said that he would have to go to homes, going door to door, knocking on doors, talking to people about the Jehovah's Witness religion, uh, he would also have to go door to door, handing out, giving people their publications, their uh, Watchtower magazine, their Awake magazine. And if somebody showed an interest in the religion, that he would then have to conduct Bible study with them. Well, he said that a dear friend of his, a dear friend of his mother passed away and he went to the funeral. He attended that woman's funeral. And he said, while at the funeral, he heard 
the gospel. He was exposed to the truth. The pastor preached and let them know, the congregation know, that it wasn't by their good works that they would have their sins forgiven and earn eternal life. But rather, eternal life was a free gift offered to everyone by faith in Jesus Christ. So if a person put their faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, they would be forgiven of their sins and they would be guaranteed eternal life. Well, he hadn't heard that before. He was exposed now to the truth. And the Spirit of God spoke to his heart and he embraced the truth. And he trusted in Christ as a savior and left that cult, left the Jehovah's Witness organization. And so it does happen. And so the right talk that Paul is referring to here focuses on false teachers. But it can also apply to anyone that you don't agree with on a matter. So when you have a disagreement with someone, what should you do? Well, first of all, Paul tells us, don't fight. Paul writes in verse 23, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. That word quarrel means to clash, to struggle to do battle. It means to get into a verbal fight with someone. Now, of course, again, that doesn't mean that you can't share your perspective on an issue with someone. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't let them know what your viewpoint is and, and the way you see a matter and even give reasons why you believe what you believe. Uh, Paul's not saying that here but rather you don't let it escalate into a war of words. You don't fight with the person. You don't argue with the person. You don't quarrel with the person. Rather, what you're to do then, Paul says next, is to be gentle. As he continues in verse 24, he writes, instead, he must be kind to everyone. So don't let the discussion get out of control. Uh, don't be flying off the handle. Keep a level head and respond to the person in a kind and gentle manner. Additionally, you're to next be patient, Paul says. Because at the very end of verse 24, Paul states very succinctly, not resentful. And so that word has the idea of being tolerant or patient with someone. It means that you don't scream at the person, throw up your arms in disgust and just stomp away. You don't do that, no. You be patient with the person. And then also, you're to speak truth. In verse 25, Paul says, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. And that word gentle means to be mild-mannered or even-tempered. You're to share the truth with others in humility, not with a know-it-all attitude. In early February, a sheriff's officer clocked a 2020 gray Kia sedan doing 95 miles an hour on Interstate 10 through the Florida Panhandle. There were two men in the car in their mid-30s, and they were driving east, and the vehicle was heading toward the metropolitan area of Orlando. Now, this corridor is a major feeder of drug trafficking into the Sunshine State. So police officers are constantly on the lookout for signs of smugglers going through Interstate 10, taking drugs into the state. Well, federal law permits officers to stop those who are breaking the law, of course. And, and they can issue tickets and they can make arrests accordingly. 
But the Fourth Amendment prohibits the search of vehicles without probable cause or reasonable suspicion. One lawyer explains it this way. Basically, a law enforcement agent's hunch without proof of illegality isn't enough for him or her to look through a car legally. Before rummaging through a vehicle, the officer would have to observe something illegal. Examples of this are seeing or smelling an illegal substance, and admission of guilt by the person driving the car is another situation in which an officer can legally examine a car. Well, when the officers pulled this car over, right in plain sight, they noticed two bags. And each container of this Ziploc container was labeled this, a bag full of drugs. Well, this site obviously led to a, a number of questions that the officers had for the two men in the vehicle. And it prompted enough reasonable suspicion to warrant a search of the car and of the bags. So inside, the Santa Rosa County Sheriff officers found methamphetamine, GHB, cocaine, fentanyl, MDMA tablets, and, and various drug paraphernalia. Both men were arrested, and they were booked into the county jail without bond. Later, the sheriff's officer office posted the following message to Facebook. Santa Rosa K-9 deputies recently assisted Florida Highway Patrol on a traffic stop on I-10 where a large amount of narcotics were discovered. Note to self, do not traffic your illegal narcotics in bags labeled bag full of drugs. Our canines can read. <laughs> well, the, the Fourth Amendment is a valuable protection against unlawful search and seizure. But you know, our God doesn't need words like probable cause or a reasonable suspicion. Our God sees all and knows all clearly. And we might attempt to hide our sins or, or at, not, at least at not put them in, in bags labeled a bag full of sins. But God still sees. God knows. He sees everything. And he wants us to move from being a dog dish to a clean plate. To, in the words of Paul, be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Some assembly required. It's every parent's nightmare on Christmas Eve to see those three dreaded words printed on a top of a box. Well, I read the story of a father who ordered a tree house for his children. And the time came to assemble the tree house. He got out the box, he opened it up, he took out the instructions, and then he carefully put each of the pieces from the box onto the floor. Now, he began to read the instructions, and he discovered that, of course, the instructions were for a treehouse. But then to his dismay, the parts in the box were for a sailboat. And so the next day, he sent an angry letter to the company complaining about the mix-up. And this is the letter, the response he received back from the company. We are truly sorry for the error and the inconvenience. However, it might help to consider the possibility that somewhere there is a man out on a lake trying to sail your treehouse. <laughs> well, well, the point is clear. To put something together, you need two things. You need right instructions and the right 
parts. And, and likewise, to be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work, you need two things. A right walk, what you do, and a right talk, what you say. You know, God wants to use you for his purposes. And you don't need to be perfect. But he does want you to be clean. Are you prepared to be used by the master? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be co-laborers with your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you have given ministry to us, the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. You have given us spiritual gifts, those opportunities to be able to serve you in unique ways. And Father, I just pray that we might be clean, that we might be prepared through a right walk with you and right talk in order to be used by you as an effective vessel for the glory of God. And all of this we thank you for, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday morning. We look forward to having you with us next Sunday as once again we look at the Word of God. See you next week.